Now, let's say you're still not persuaded. Let's say we're, we still, you should always be skeptical, right? You should always ask yourself, could I be wrong? Am I deceiving myself? And one of the ways we could be deceiving ourselves here, and I'm only going to do this in three minutes because I want to leave time for Q&A, is to um, ask, well, what if we included the whole world in a set of counterfactual exercises, what they would have looked like in the absence of patents? We can't do that. Econometricians have, done, have tried to approximate this. In the article I circulated today, Patents and the Wealth of Nations, there's references to the econometric literature. With the exception of one study, which is very badly designed, and I think almost on purpose, badly designed, they all find that there is a positive relationship between changes in intellectual property laws and economic growth. Now, I'm going to do a little bit of intellectual cleaning up here. It's possible that there are a set of facts that, if true, should cause us to dismiss everything I've said so far. What if the world has now changed? So all the stuff about the past is now irrelevant because we're in a different world. What if patent trolls now stifle innovation by exploiting the intellectual property system? What if the world's now different because there's lots of what are called standard essential patents inside all the IT products that are at the cutting edge of technology? Uh, and what if uh, the world's different now because people can patent software? I don't have time to go into the evidence for all of these, uh, these, these facts, but here's the bottom line. There's nothing new about software patenting. There's nothing new about patent trolls. In the 19th century, they're called patent sharks. Um, and there's nothing new about um, many patents being embedded in a complex product. I've also spent uh, a number of years actually examining each of these hypotheses to see what the impact, let's say, of patent trolls or standard essential patents is supposed to have been as a matter of theory, and then gathering data to see, well, how big could the impact be on stifling innovation? Here's the bottom line, and then I'll throw things open to questions. Uh, on the patent troll issue, if you look at the publicly traded patent trolls, you notice two really interesting features of them. The first is they, they, um, they spend about a third of their revenues on R&D. They're actually quite R&D intense. In fact, they spend about 10 times more on R&D than Apple does as a percentage of their revenues. The second is they're really, really, really small. So any impact that they could have on the market is going to be very, if you take the transfer to PAEs, right, then the deadweight loss is going to be smaller than the total transfer, and you can measure the size of the transfer. And it turns out to be about 0.025% of high-tech revenues. That is, they're just too small to matter, even if they are pernicious. And the evidence is, given how much they spend on R&D, they're likely not pernicious. Um, the, uh, when it comes to um, um, the claim about lots of standard essential patents, one of the things we did here at Hoover was uh, we, we, uh, we spent about a year gathering the data on every firm that licenses patents into the smartphone ecosystem. And then we added up what all those patents come to, what the royalty charges are. And the answer is it's about $14 billion a year. And the smartphone market's about $425 billion a year, which is to say it's about 3% of the value of the phone, which is to say that the average smartphone has $10 worth. The market prices the patents at $10. So it can't be the case that, this, that the $10 is the $10 earned by the patentees. It represents some sort of monopoly that they're leverage, le levying on smartphones. So you can reject that hypothesis. Um, I'm going to run through these very quickly and get to the end. Bottom line I want to leave you with is the follows. The evidence is strongly consistent with the hypothesis that the patent system and copyrights have played a key role in American economic leadership. And in economic leadership for other countries around the world. Why should you care? Well, when I mentioned patent trolls, so many people were doing this. You've all heard about patent trolls. It's really very interesting why you've heard about it. 
And I'm going to advance the following hypothesis. The whole patent troll narrative, which is an, is an attack on the patent system broadly defined, not on patent trolls, because they're too small to matter. And they're advanced by a group of high-tech companies who own markets rather than patents. And it's in their interest to reduce the value of patents because they want to squeeze their suppliers. This is an inter-industry fight. But it's an inter-industry fight that had a huge public policy outcome, which was to reduce the value of patents. To make it, basically, they came down to making it harder to enforce a patent and harder to, to, well, make it harder to enforce a patent. We'll leave it at that. Part of this was a Supreme Court decision. Part of this was the American Events Act of 2011. Part of it was stated policies by the Department of Justice in, during the Obama administration. But I want to make it clear that this is not a Democrat versus Republican issue. And so as we think about the next industrial revolution, the one the, that involves very fast um, IT, uh, robotics, um, and uh, artificial intelligence, uh, one big policy question before the United States is what will be the right intellectual property system to maintain leadership in those industries? I would advance the hypothesis that a weak patent system is going to put us at a disadvantage. Let me throw things open to questions. Thank you. And this, the TAs are going to control who gets to ask questions. <laughs>